Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. We are so happy to have you with us tonight and also so honored to have so many um, people with us um, on this uh, night to talk about a very important um, topic of great interest to so many people. So I would like to acknowledge, as we start our program, um, our audience, which is, um, yes, I would like to acknowledge our audience um, consisting of so many people. We are a um, program that has been uh, operating since 2020, and we have many people who come every month, and we have many wonderful um, people who are dropping in just now. Um, the scope of um, interest in this topic is huge, and we want to give as much time as possible to everybody to listen to uh, what Jim has to say and participate in discussion. Um, the very fact that we are all gathered here tonight to discuss um, nutrients in San Francisco Bay and um, water quality is a honor for us and a validation of our mission to bring nature and people together in urbanized um, region of California. Um, we'd like to um, let everybody know who we are. Uh, we are Rotary Nature Center Friends, a 501c3 charitable educational nonprofit. All of our work is done by volunteers. And we are um, not a part of the city of Oakland, and we appreciate the um, support that they give us through their um, adopt a spot programs. Uh, we are not uh, formally connected with them. Um, and um, so, let's see, we are um, Rotary Nature Center friends. We are also not uh, connected with the Rotary Club. And um, there's a long story behind the name which dates back to the um, foundation of the Rotary Nature Center and it's a philosophy um, articulated by the founders, um, Paul Covell and Rex Burris. And we can go into that and you can find out about that on our website. So, so that's who we are. Um, and given that we have such a um, group of people assembled here today, I'd like to just encourage everybody to enjoy your, yourself, relax, and listen, and learn together. Please um, be mindful of that we have people with various levels of expertise. We have people who know a great deal about this topic and people who know very little, um, have a lot to learn, and we want to be kind and courteous to everybody who is here with us tonight. Um, so um, before I go on, I would like to acknowledge the speakers that we have had in the past in um, our programs um, who have contributed so much to our, to our awareness and understanding of water quality and um, issues of, its, um, of nutrients in the Bay. So I'd like to mention, first of all, 
Dr. Richard Bailey, who in Lakeside Chat number five talked about um, the uh, the uh, with a, a white uh, paper about dissolved oxygen and the various um, factors that uh, contributed to concern about low dissolved oxygen in Lake Merritt. Moving onward, um, in 20, um, in Lakeside Chat 22, uh, I'd like to acknowledge Damon Todd, who um, gave a wonderful um, program right after the um, horrific field fish kill, which is um, burned in the minds of everyone who has um, been around Lake Merritt. And he um, caught us up and introduced us to the literature that uh, about water quality that has gone back for, for many decades, which many of us were unaware of. And then he took us into a consideration of what might be happening uh, in that fish kill. I'd like to acknowledge as well, um, our current speaker, Jim Irvin, who talked about uh, the fish kill and fish in the bay um, for Lakeside Chat 24. And I am going to drop into the chat the um, links for all of those um, chats if you would like to look them up. So here they go. So thank you then to everyone who is here. Um, Jim, we are so delighted to have you with us. And we want to give you um, the full hour to um, make your presentation and to um, hear from many of the um, guests that are here with us tonight. So are we ready to launch? So uh, yeah, hello everybody. My name is Jim Irvin, as Katie was mentioning. I, uh, uh, I'm showing the slide. Uh, it's uh, the San Jose Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility. That's, that's the place where I worked for 26 and a half years. I like to say round up and say 27. Um, I was, my final job was a compliance manager. And um, also in the audience today, I've already seen in the, in the group that uh, we have Amit Matsudi, who was the general manager at the wastewater treatment plant in San Jose. He now has the equivalent position at East Bay Mud, your local sewer plant around the corner from you folks. Well, we don't say sewer plant, we say wastewater treatment facility. It's a matter of pride in the profession. We also have uh, Lorian Fono. Uh, she is the executive director of Bay Area Clean Water Agencies. So she is the coordinator of all of the 37 to 42 ish wastewater treatment plants around the Bay Area as representative to the water boards. Uh, and, uh, and also Eric Dunleavy. He was my, my uh, uh, companion and uh, the person who took over my job when I left as compliance manager. He is currently the compliance manager at the San Jose. Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility. And um, I think, I know that Almeet and Lorian probably want to say a few things after my presentation is done. So I'm going to try to talk really, really fast as I go through this. But needless to say, nutrients in the Bay has been a big interest issue for me for at least, I'd say 15 years, maybe longer than that. Um, and something I think about a lot. So number one is defining the nutrients. And when we're, when we're talking about nutrients in the Bay, we're talking about nitrogen and phosphorus, not all the other stuff. You know, obviously nutrient is anything that you or any animal or even bacteria will eat, uh, but we're really focused on fertilizer. <laughs> we're talking about nitrogen and phosphate, uh, phosphorus or phosphate. And nitrogen comes in, in various forms in the wastewater and in the Bay water. Um, nitrogen is what we excrete in our urine. Um, it is um, what we feed to our plants, uh, makes the world go round. In fact, most life on Earth, obviously carbon is the major nutrient source. That's the macronutrient. But without nitrogen, life doesn't happen. And the same thing with phosphorus. Um, the basic ratios in living tissue is uh, shown on the screen there. You get about 100 carbons. So that means 5% of your body and, and all living things is nitrogen, roughly on average and about 1% phosphorus. So we eat it and we excrete it. And there's about 7.5 million people in the Bay. So we excrete a lot of the stuff into the Bay. It goes through the sewer plants. It gets treated if the plant, the sewer treatment facility is, is optimized to remove nutrient. If it isn't, uh, this stuff pretty much slips through. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, why is nitrogen and phosphorus a problem today? It's because humans make a lot of it. 
Uh, ever since the early 1900s, uh, the invention of the Haber-Bosch process, uh, it uh, was able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and create fertilizer and uh, phosphates with heavy machinery. Uh, we no longer have to mine, you know, bird guano and bat guano. Uh, we can pretty much mine it up from ancient seabeds all over the world in Morocco and Florida and other places. Um, now, when you're dealing with nitrogen as a nutrient in the environment, uh, nitrogen is generally a limiting nutrient in salt water. It tends to be a problem in salt water, not so much in, in fresh water. I mean, either one can be a problem either way, but phosphorus is mostly a problem in fresh water. So that's why it's not really thought to be as big a problem in San Francisco Bay. Up in the Delta, yes, but not down in the Bay. And uh, in sewage wastewater, we tend to get about 45 to 50 milligrams per liter in sewage of nitrogen and six milligrams per liter of uh, phosphorus. So lower concentration, and I'll get into that. But the major problem with nitrogen is that, you know, it pretty much follows the concentration of nitrogen uh, and the load of nitrogen in sewage pretty much follows the level of population. Whereas we've seen phosphorus really drop low, lower than it was in the past because of phosphate bands and detergents and such, because it was identified as such a problem uh, some decades ago. Um, so what happens when you have too much phosphorus in fresh water? I think you've all read the news stories and such. In the Great Lakes, they had a heck of a problem with this through the 2000s, uh, going back to the 1980s, really, um, where different waterways, uh, uh, segments of, of the Great Lakes were impacted by phosphorus. You got cyanobacteria blooms, which are very toxic, um, and it also draws down dissolved oxygen, kills fish, kills ecosystems. A uh, big problem there. And with nitrogen, like I said, mainly a saltwater problem or more of a saltwater problem. And up and down the eastern seaboard, uh, back going back to the 80s and through the 90s, um, all kinds of problems in, in uh, Long Island Sound, Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay. Some of those have been resolved uh, with regulatory action. Some of those are still ongoing problems. Um, Chesapeake Bay, they spent billions of dollars, billions with a B, uh, to upgrade sewer plants to treat nitrogen. Uh, because uh, Chesapeake Bay was so badly impacted. Um, and who do we have to uh, credit this? Uh, mostly Fritz Haber and his invention of the uh, Haber-Bosch process, which pulls nitrogen, uh, uh, it catalyzes uh, the uh, uh, nitrogen in air and uh, with a great amount of energy and pressure uh, can fix nitrogen to hydrogen It makes ammonia. Um, and ammonia, of course, once once they were able to do that, it was like a golden key to unlock nutrient around the world. Uh, this this fueled a, a big part of the Green Revolution uh, when fertilizer became cheap and, and economical from the Haber-Bosch process. And I threw a couple of wiki facts in there. There's 230 million tons of nitrogen fertilizer fixed per year. Uh, one to two percent of the world energy consumption for decades has been the Haber process. And 50 percent of human of nitrogen in human tissue comes from Haber-Bosch, which implies that half of us in the room today wouldn't be here had uh, Haber, Fritz Haber, not invented his, his machine. And so uh, in that respect, uh, he's feeding a hungry planet. It goes into uh, all the agricultural uh, development as well. So cows, chickens, pigs, all the corn that's grown uh, comes from Haber-Bosch process. And we may not like the excess, but there's a lot of parts of the world. You know, I, when I was younger, I lived in Korea for a couple of years and, and I met and I hung out with uh, some Korean guys about my age, you know, the early thirties, we were in, in the late eighties. Um, and they were telling me that, you know, amongst them, they uh, pretty much celebrate the fact that, you know, in Korea, they, they are the first, they were the first generation who has lived without famine. And it always blew my mind because, uh, you know, being American, I was maybe third or fourth generation from famine. Um, we don't think about it, but we uh, humans used to live in a hungry world. Now, you know, our problem is diabetes and, and, uh, and <laughs> morbid obesity, which is interesting. So anyway, so here we come to San Francisco Bay. We were not worried too much about nutrient until 2011. And that was the year when the federal EPA decided that this was going to be a priority issue, and, and really because of the problems on the East Coast and in the Great Lakes, that nutrients were going to be regulated. Um, we in the wastewater industry, mm, 
you know, were uh, skeptical, I guess you would say, but there was no question that the human population around the Bay Area is huge. And uh, early on, uh, San Francisco Estuary Institute and USGS were, you know, they kicked off the effort by uh, doing the studies of San Francisco Bay, of different segments of the Bay shown on the screen here, and uh, where the nutrient loads were coming from. And then, in fact, it was there was no question about it that 60 percent of the load is coming from the, the wastewater treatment plants, you know, about about 15 percent coming from the Delta area, about 20 percent from just general rainwater uh, runoff. So, yeah, everything that washes off the streets does contribute part of that load. So for that reason, you know, you should be careful about how you apply fertilizers and what you uh, what you dump on the streets. But uh, but 60 percent was from uh, wastewater treatment and it. Uh, they wanted to clean it up. So, and along with that, um, I'm showing one of the uh, one of the early Cepheus, San Francisco Estuary Institute uh, studies, and that was of Lower South Bay. Um, and there was a similar study for uh, Sassoon Bay in the north as well, um, and kind of helped define the problem. Most most of the nutrient problem, I won't. It's not all of it, but most of it is uh, in in the South Bay, the general South Bay, the Greater South Bay. Uh, above Lower South Bay and to include Lower South Bay. And that's because most of the population is in Lower South Bay or it is in South Bay generally and Lower South Bay. Uh, there's about 2 million people in Lower South Bay alone, not so much in North Bay. And plus, uh, North Bay is a river dominated estuary. So whatever nutrients are there tend to flush out, maybe make it directly to the ocean. Uh, and that could be a problem in itself, but not... Um, um, not quite as much in, in the Bay generally. Um, and in Lower South Bay and South Bay, uh, one of the problems is it's a tidal lagoon. And so the, the flows don't go quite as strongly. There's not two, two big rivers that uh, push the nutrients out. In fact, in Lower South Bay, residence time is huge, like up, up to a couple of months before, on a theoretical basis, before the water change happens. Um, there's three fairly substantial, one very large uh, so, wastewater treatment plant in Lower South Bay, and that was the one I was working at. But encouragingly, uh, the, the same study showed that San, San, San Jose, even before this nutrient issue kicked off, uh, shown in pink, uh, the discharge loads of nitrogen and phosphorus um, had dropped considerably because we'd uh, undertaken a biological nutrient removal uh, phase in our, in our wastewater treatment. The other compelling argument that uh, nutrients uh, needed to be reduced in San Francisco Bay, or at least we had to look for an upper limit, uh, was the population had been growing and uh, the and, and would continue to grow. On the uh, left-hand side of the screen, I'm showing the slide that we were we used back then, and I used up until very recently, showing the continuous growth of human population in the San Francisco Bay area. And I updated it with uh, the other uh, image on the other side showing the kind of like the rest of the story, the more uh, current population level. And, uh, you know, the good news is population kind of kind of peaked uh, after COVID uh, and and even shrunk just a little bit. And um, so it puts puts some of the pressure off. It doesn't I, I have no doubt that uh, the human population in San Francisco Bay will will increase in the far future, though, and, and at some point nutrients need to be controlled. Um, the other uh, the other big argument, and, and to this day, the San Francisco Estuary Institute and in the Pulse of the Bay documents and things like that that come out, um, they constantly express the concern that San Francisco Bay is among the most nutrient enriched estuaries worldwide. Um, that was that was the uh, the problem statement back in 2011 when this thing started. And that's the problem statement that was in the latest uh, Pulse of the, of the uh, Bay uh, booklet that uh, Cepi put out. And, and this is showing uh, kind of a doctored up chart, the same chart they were showing back then, that portions, especially Lower South Bay and Sassoon Bay, are tremendously over enriched. Uh, it's showing uh, uh, nitrate, uh, nitrogen concentrations on the horizontal scale and chlorophyll average, uh, average uh, phytoplankton bloom on the uh, vertical scale. And Lower South Bay and Sassoon have tremendously more, uh, higher concentration of nitrogen compared to what Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay and Maryland Bays and Bar Barnegat, New Jersey and Narragansett, 
all of those places were impaired by nutrient, but for some reason, and because the biota was affected, but for some reason, lower South Bay and Sassoon Bay uh, just weren't, weren't showing any signs of eutrophication despite the high concentrations. To this day, I still kind of choke on this a little bit. Um, and, and that's because, you know, in, in a healthy bay, usually we see higher concentrations of, of phytoplankton. Um, and I monitor the monitor the uh, biota in Lower South Bay. My personal feeling is something something you know something really is strongly Im impairing or or at least affecting the phytoplankton blooms. And to me, that's the bigger problem than what the nutrient might be in the future. But but anyway, I, I shall move on. Um, and uh, so the the problem statement also included, and and even in the current uh, version of the, of the uh, the pulse of the estuary, that the concern is that San Francisco, San Francisco Bay's historical resistance to eutrophication could weaken. And one thing that, that keeps San Francisco Bay so low in chlorophyll despite the high nutrient levels is that San Francisco Bay is a very muddy bay. It's very, very brown and turbid. And there's concern that that sediment level will drop, and it has been dropping in recent decades. Um, and that's strong tides and flushing, of course, that won't change, but that helps sweep the nutrient out of the bay. And uh, the other concern that uh, dense populations of filter feeding clams in certain regions, by which they meant Sassoon Bay, uh, were keeping nutrient or, or should say phytoplankton under control and that that might disappear at some point. Um, and again, just me, uh, well, that's a complicated issue. And this is why. In Sassoon Bay, they used to have a lot of uh, a fairly uh, decent phytoplankton bloom. The chlorophyll would go up to 10 to 15 milligrams per or micrograms per uh, per liter at uh, at certain segments. Uh, this is showing uh, phytoplankton blooms in the 70s through the 80s, shown in pink in, in Sassoon Bay. Uh, that's when the bay was considered to be healthy. And then the Corbula clam, which is a non-native clam from Asia, it invaded in 1987. And all of a sudden, the phytoplankton blooms just flattened. And, and we know that that was detrimental to fish populations in the North Bay. So, uh, yeah, I would say that was a bad clam. I would like that clam to uh, not be there. Um, it, it, it suggests to me that, yeah, the clam wasn't the problem and won't be the problem. I'd, I'd rather that clam go away. Um, and we see a similar thing in, in Lower South Bay. We see a very, well, very low phytoplankton bloom in, com I guess, in comparison to what we should see with the nutrient uh, concentrations. And so anyway, the latest pulse of the bay, the statement is, evidence suggests that the bay's resistance to elevated nutrients may be waning. And this includes, there's increased phytoplankton biomass in South Bay and Central Bay. That is true. Um, not dramatically true, though, and, and this was a big concern in 2010, 2005, 2010. We saw in South Bay that the uh, phytoplankton blooms were increasing dramatically, but then it leveled off and then it dropped down. Don't know what's going on with that. Even even the pulse of the bay, they say, well, it's it's kind of mysterious. This is absolutely a thing that should be continue to be monitored. Uh, it's very important, critical for for the ec ecosystem. Um, it's still a little bit questionable whether that's signaling that nutrients will suddenly become an issue. Um, number two problem, frequent occurrences of harm harmful algae and their associated toxins. This has now become the big issue because of H. Akashiwo blooms the last two years, of course. Um, however, again, that relationship between nutrient and harmful algal blooms is not really clear, uh, not to me at least, uh, on the same weekend that H. I. Kashiwa struck in 2022, uh, our crew, the UC Davis crew, was in Lower South Bay and where the nutrient concentrations are higher and we were seeing nothing but green water. We, we did, uh, H. I. Kashiwa was detected by Eric Dunlevy and his crew in the uh, city of San Jose. Uh, so we know it was present, but it did not bloom and it should have bloomed if, if nutrient uh, are a cause. And then the third thing, they say low dissolved oxygen in some tidal slough habitats indicates a problem or could. Um, and again, 
lower South Bay, we've been studying this for, for years now, and most of our native fishes are highly, not only highly tolerant of low dissolved oxygen, they're actually attracted to it. The, uh, the, the anchovies come in the summer and they, they swim around in, in dissolved oxygen as low as two, even lower, uh, and spawn and feed. Uh, and the uh, long jaw mudsucker, which I'm showing in the lower corner, that, that fish is adapted to uh, live in basically dissolved uh, water with dissolved oxygen down to zero. It can live out, out of water for up to 12 to 24 hours, um, suggesting that low dissolved oxygen in tidal sloughs is, is, uh, is kind of a natural thing. But that's just me. I, I shall move on. Um, so anyway, the, in 2011, the water board put out its intent that nutrients shall be regulated. And the initial response, this is, this is me, most wastewater treatment plants might not acknowledge this, but I say it was the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Um, I think they've reached acceptance, the, the agencies. I've, I've been retired for six years now, so I don't have to worry about it. And as you can tell, I'm still in the bargaining phase regarding uh, nutrients in the Bay. I'm, I'm not completely convinced that it's an issue. However, I will say that, uh, you know, and, and the problem is that it's very expensive to upgrade a, a wastewater treatment plant to, to treat nutrients. But on the other hand, it is what we have nutrient, w wastewater treatment plants to do. And, uh, and the, the final bottom line was that I was working at the best nu <laughs> biological nutrient removal facility in San Francisco Bay. Um, it was, it was uh, the best job I ever had. And I, I really uh, enjoyed this nutrient issue. Uh, and enjoyed the fact that it hit when I was a compliance manager for the plant. So anyway, the first nutrient permit was issued in 2014 from the Water Board. It's a five-year permit. The second iteration of that permit was in 2019, and the next iteration will be this year, 2024, uh, will be reissued for another five years. Each iteration of the nutrient watershed permit gets a little bit tougher and, uh, and promises nutrient numeric limits at a future point but it didn't happen yet, and it won't happen. Won't happen for a few more years. Um, so the water board did hear uh, the agency concerns and concerns like mine, and uh, you know, basically they put us on a track. Uh, all the all the wastewater treatment plants on a track to start looking at ways to treat nutrients because it's coming. Uh, you will be regulated. And again, sixty percent of the new Nitrogen and phosphorus loads uh, come from the wastewater treatment plants. 80 to 85 percent of the nutrient load is in South Bay. And uh, and there I was, uh, the compliance manager at the San Jose Santa Clara plant, which is uh, not the biggest, but well, it's the biggest plant in, in San Francisco Bay. It's not the biggest discharger of nutrient, however. Um, and for this slide and for future of all the slides, I've, I've been presenting uh, each wastewater treatment plant as a snowflake because of something very profound that once one of the engineers uh, for uh, HDR Inc, who uh, they were uh, contracted by BACWA to do uh, one of the permit requirements in, in this uh, waste nutrient watershed permit. And that was the optimization upgrade studies. Uh, HDR Inc was, was tasked to go to each one of the 37 participating plants and perform a study. And, and he kind of not so much a complaint, but he was sort of sort of telling me that, boy, this job's a challenge because wastewater treatment plants are like snowflakes. Each one is unique and no two are alike. Um, and it's quite true. There, there are no two. I, go figure why. But there is not a similarity between any, any two plants if you go around. And I'll show more about that. Anyway, so the solution is the wastewater tr treatment plant. How do we remove nutrients? Most of this crowd is fairly astute. They've been to a plant before. You're aware that there is primary sedimentation, and then you have secondary aeration, secondary clarification. That is the beating heart of, of the uh, wastewater treatment plant, whether it treats nutrients or not. That's where most of the uh, pollutants are, are removed, and that's by uh, way of, of cultivating bacteria. So you have a living, breathing bacteria factory in your secondary process, um, and uh, that's what I'll be talking about. Anyway, uh, a couple of terms that you need to know if you've never heard them before. Uh, one is BOD, biochemical oxygen demand. Uh, that's a measure of how much bacterial, uh, uh, I guess, demand on of oxygen uh, when they're they're oxidizing carbonaceous material or or uh, organic material in wastewater. So if you dump sewage in wastewater, 
or if you dump sugar in wastewater, for example, uh, bacteria will draw down the oxygen as they consume that material. Um, and then BOD is broken into two components. There's, there's carbonaceous BOD, that's your organic material, but there's also nitrogenous BOD, uh, which is nitrogen, ammonia. Uh, it also draws, uh, or the bacteria that consume uh, nitrogen compounds also draw down uh, 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 the uh, BOD, total suspended solids, solid retention time. So modern day sewage treatment started in 1914. This was a, a discovery, the bombshell discovery by Arden Lockhart in Manchester, England. They've been working, they and other researchers have been working on the problem of human population growing and the fact that wastewater treatment plants, uh, well, big cities were growing and the uh, the sewage problem was becoming just enormous. There was no no way, no good way to uh, treat sewage up to that point other than to discharge it into a water body and the water bodies were getting absolutely putrid. Um, so folks in England and the U.S. were researching, and they had learned by the late 1800s that if you force air, bubble air through wastewater, it treats water pretty well, but it's unreliable, it's fickle, and it's slow. Uh, Arden and Lockhart somehow suddenly figured uh, in a series of experiments that by, in, in, they, in the, the, the way they were doing it was in a sequencing batch reactor. So they would fill a tank aerate a tank, settle the, the sludge out of the water column. The water got pretty clean and they would, they would decant it. And as long as they kept the sludge and used it the next time around, magically, uh, the process went much faster. Uh, when they discovered this in 1914, they didn't know whether the process was bacterial or biological or chemical. Uh, they just knew that it worked. It wasn't until 10 years later that people you know, researching this figured out, oh, it's, it is living bacteria and you have to basically reuse it over and over again. It's like uh, baking sourdough bread or making yogurt uh, and, and even more so with, with wastewater. You need to, you need to retain a, a significant proportion of your, of your population of bacteria. Um, and that, that was the magic, that was the bombshell discovery. And then in, as years went on, other researchers and other, other municipalities experimented with this thing they learned how to flow the water through the system. They learned how to how to basically pump what they called return activated sludge uh, back into the system at the upstream end and accelerate the amount of treatment that was going. Um, we call it the return activated sludge process. Uh, and one of the problems they discovered early on was that if you aerate too much, then you start to uh, the bacteria start to uh, competitively chew up the ammonia. And that was something they didn't necessarily want to treat. And, and you think, well, why wouldn't you want to treat ammonia? Ammonia is nasty. Uh, but the issue at that time was they, it wasn't really a problem. And you greatly increase the cost of treatment if you have to drive a lot of more oxygen. And so there's a lot more energy and a lot more effort to, uh, to keep up the treatment. So they were actually designing systems like a step feed system to prevent nitrification as, as you were doing secondary treatment and the return activated sludge. But then things turned around, you know, by the, by the 50s, 60s, and 70s, people were realizing that there's too much ammonia in the system, at least in some, some municipalities, some places like San Jose, too much ammonia. So now you really want to nitrify and you have to undertake these other newer types of systems um, again, they're all ret return activated sludge type of processes, but the innovations that were developed over those decades in the oxidation ditch, the Lutzak, Lutzak editor or the Bardenfoe process, this is where you add anoxic or anaerobic zones uh, to your tanks where you don't aerate and you force the, the microbes, I, I call them bugs very frequently, uh, bugs means bacteria basically in my speak. Um, and you force them to go through an anaerobic zone. They call that a selector. It basically, uh, you're selecting for bacteria that uh, want to nitrify or, or that want to denitrify in some cases. Um, and it's a way of managing your bacterial populations. And so briefly, very briefly, you can ask me questions later. I, I won't be able to go into this in great detail, but to understand the wastewater treatment process, you have to understand life itself. In fact, you learn so much about life itself. That's what makes it such a such a cool job to have. 
Um, so you have a process of catabolism where you break down big compounds and make little compounds to harvest energy, to glue together amino acids into proteins. Um, that's catabolism on one side. Anabolism is like anabolic steroids where you build up body tissue. Um, and then the other thing, just like us, uh, bacteria, uh, most living things, there's, there's some differences, but most living things and, and all of our sewer plant bacteria, for the most part, uh, they, they require an electron donor and an electron acceptor. Electron donor is what you eat. Think of a juicy donut with sugar and carbohydrates and a little bit of fats. That's your electron donor. What you breathe is the electron acceptor. That's where your cellular respiration takes advantage of oxygen as an electron acceptor. It makes it makes it makes you it allows you to live basically. But bacteria can flip the script, and there are many of the sewer plant bacteria. They eat ammonia, if you can imagine that. That is their electron donor. Uh, nitrate, nitrite, sometimes sulfate is the electron acceptor. So they can actually respire. I say breathe, even though bacteria don't have lungs, but they they inhale and they exhale so to speak, um, and the, the byproducts from their respiration go on to feed the next population. So it's a really cool process. But this explains, if you're thinking, why do you need anaerobic zones and aerobic zones and anoxic zones? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to humans, but it makes a heck of a lot of sense to a bacteria where some of the bacteria, the bacteria that oxidize ammonia, they require a lot of oxygen. But on the other hand, when you want to denitrify and turn the nitrate into nitrogen gas and send it back to the atmosphere, you have to have a no oxygen environment or, or denitrification will not happen. And about 80% of sewer microbes, the, especially the denitrifiers, they will, they will use, they're facultative, they will use oxygen if they get it, but they will, they will use nitrous, nitric oxide if you don't provide them with any oxygen. So anyway, that's part of why that process works. And then for phosphorus, which again, probably less a problem of the bay, but nonetheless, for phosphorus, uh, you can enhance the natural uh, bacterial uptake of phosphorus by having that anaerobic or anaerobic zone up front. We call it the anaerobic selector. And basically the anaerobic selector is like a valley of death for bacteria. Most bacteria cannot metabolize when they have no, no electron acceptor whatsoever. The anaer anaerobic selector must have no oxygen, no nitrate, no nitrite, and if you have those conditions, most bacteria, they simply can't grow and many will die, except for types of bacteria that can take up phosphorus, pack it into their bodies, into their little microbial bacterial bodies, create polyphosphates. Uh, it, it's as if they fill their own oxygen tank and, and phosphate is their oxygen. They'll break it off one, one uh, phosphate ion at a time. And that gives them just enough energy to metabolize and, uh, and basically survive through the anaerobic selector. And then when you circulate them through the aerobic tank, they take up more phosphorus. And then as you're wasting your sludge at the end of the process, you're also dumping more phosphorus into your sludge solids and, and out of the water column. So anyway, fascinating bi biology. I realize that most people probably not, probably not as much interest to you, but that, those are the dirty uh, details of how it's done. So in a straight secondary plant with no biological nutrient removal, uh, this is showing you the typical results. Um, basically, 90% roughly of BOD and 90% of total suspended solids get removed from wastewater from straight secondary pot process. This would be the old-fashioned pre-1950s, no nutrient removal. And you'll see that nitrogen, you get a little bit of removal, but no, nothing significant. But, but phosphorus, you lose about half, uh, even with no, no upgrade whatsoever. And I'm going to show you, it's a little complicated, but you know this is the San Jose, Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility. This is a, a full four-stage step feed biological nutrient removal process. Um, I, won't, I won't go into dirty details, but basically... Uh, the same number, the same level or concentrations of BOD, TSS, total nitrogen, and phosphorus going in and coming out, you can see tremendous amount of BOD reduction, TSS, total suspended solids. Nitrogen goes down to, uh, nitrogen is removed about 80%. So you're, you're left with about 20% of what went going in and phosphorus gets down to, uh, I'd say reliably less than one, but not always less than one, uh, maybe a little over one at, at times. And 
I won't go over this in detail. I, I did go over this uh, in the last presentation I gave a year ago, but this is showing you the, the nitrogen cycle. It's like a triangle of, uh, you have basically organic nitrogen coming in from plants and, and tissue and, and what we urinate it goes into the wastewater treatment plant. Usually in the sewer through a process of ammonification, they call that mineralization. The nitrogen turns into, uh, or the organic material is broken down. The nitrogen turns into ammonia. And then ammonia is taken, it comes into the wastewater treatment plant. It's nitrified. This is again, that, that daisy chain of electron acceptors, electron uh, donors. So the, the, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, they eat ammonia and they breathe in oxygen. They need a lot of oxygen. And the nitrite oxidizing bacteria, the next population in that chain, the same thing, but then they, they breathe in oxygen, they eat uh, nitrite and they exhale, uh, or I should say they, yeah, they exhale uh, nitrate, which is taken by the denitrifiers, assuming they have an environment with no oxygen. And they send the uh, nitrogen back up into the atmosphere where Fritz Haber can turn it back into ammonia for fertilizer. Um, and some years ago, I was so fascinated by this process. I, I was reading a, a paper by Pomeroy and et al. in 2007, and they were talking about the amount of kilowatts of energy that it takes to, for a, a gram, a dry gram of, of, uh, of, a, of a typical bacteria, in that case, it was B natrogens, um, saying two kilowatts per dry gram, which represents the energy of uh, cell division. And so back of the napkin, I said, good Lord, we have, we have 600,000 kilograms per day flows through our plant. That represents like, 500 or 200 to 1,000 gigawatts, a uh, tremendous amount of energy. It's not necessarily energy we can harvest for any other purpose, but it represents the extreme, extreme efficiency of bacteria. Uh, there's no human process that can match that. That's, that's the kind of efficiency that you get out of that process, um, which um, makes me kind of proud. But um, so... The, uh, in the terms of the nutrient watershed permit, the first group, uh, or I should say the current group annual report, the last one that was available online, was in 2022. Um, there's a little bit, there's, there's good news in there. Not, maybe, not, maybe not tremendously great news, but good news because there was no overall, despite 14 years now has passed, there's been no overall increase in, in nutrient flows or loads. Um, and in fact, nitrate has trended slightly down um, in good part because of the, the Oakland plant, East Bay Mud, and San Jose has continued to improve. Um, and um, yeah, overall, I was going to say as a side story, uh, separate and apart from our group effort here in the San Francisco Bay, uh, the SAC regional plant had a separate permit from the Central Valley uh, Regional Water Board. And they were also required to reduce nutrients under, under a much tighter scale. And they spent about $2 billion doing it. And uh, they finally finished on that. So they are upgraded. There is a tremendous reduction in the nutrient load in Sacramento River already. Uh, and a very slight load. Uh, this, this chart here is uh, called the bubble chart. It's showing uh, each size of bubble represents the amount of either secondary, uh, or I should say amount of either ammonia from secondary treatment or nitrate from uh, the uh, uh, BNR treatment from uh, different plants. So uh, when you see a blue bubble, that represents nitrate. When you see a purple bubble, that represents the ammonia load. Uh, and that was prior to uh, upgrades, which is still more or less the same place. Um, and Lorian Fono uh, in the audience, she provided me these charts. This is just showing you the latest up-to-date uh, totals showing what the contributory load of nitrogen is from each of the 36, 37 plants in the Bay Area. Um, and basic point is that most of the load, over half of the load, comes from just the first three or four uh, plants in the bay. So East Bay Mud, East Bay Discharger Authority, San Francisco uh, Public Utility, Public Utility, I want to say Commission, but I'm not sure that's right. But anyway, the Southeast plant and then San Jose. Um, it's showing in two different ways. So the bar chart, and then we have sort of like an area distribution just showing that if you can get nutrient reduction from those first four or five biggies, uh, you've really reduced pr practically most of the load in the bay. 
Um, and so with that in mind, I just wanted to mention those three big plants because needless to say, where you folks are located over there in Lake Merritt and where Seaplane Lagoon is, where Asia Kashiwo bloomed, yes, it is triangulated uh, uh, amongst those three uh, biggest dischargers up further up in the North Bay. Um, however, again, you know, the by far the biggest one is San Jose down south uh, and the nutrient loads in the lower South Bay because of that flushing regime are higher. Um, good news, the pulse of the estuary says that Amongst the dischargers uh, from the largest POD, largest top four PO, or top five POTWs, they actually have reduced. And again, this is large part because of East Bay mud and because of San Jose. But there's also a number of initiatives I kind of highlighted in yellow for the EBDA dischargers, uh, some different nutrient things they've been working on um, and with some minor reduction. But but so far, most things are plans in the works. I was going to say uh, every every wastewater treatment plant is an individual unlike any other. They're like snowflakes. Uh, EBDA represents six different facilities that are all tied together into this, a single discharge pipe. Um, so that's like, I think of EBDA as like a snowstorm of, of all these different little snowflake plants. Um, this is just giving a little bit of summary. If anybody's interested, we can go over this later. But they're, they're, they're different. Each one, or I should say four of the major uh, EBDA contributory plants and the different things they're doing to reduce nutrients. Uh, the challenge of geography for San Francisco, for example, many many plants face this challenge. Uh, some don't, but many, most of them do. They're, they're like in a city that's built up all around them. For San Francisco, there's an industrialized area all around that Southeast plant. And for uh, East Bay Mud, those of you who visited, you know, it's like right in that maze of freeways that goes into the uh, the uh, uh, eastern side of, of the Bay Bridge, uh, there's not too much area to grow into. So as you make improvements, it's a really tight constraints. It really drives costs to try to upgrade these plants. And uh, there's a little paper here. Uh, I, I, I didn't know if Don Gray would be in the audience. Amit is here. He can talk about this. This is the uh, full-scale nitrogen removal that they've been experimenting with uh, and, and with success in, at East Bay Mud. Um, so they've, uh, they're basically, they've, they're going BNR. They're, uh, like, like the San Jose plant did some decades ago. So big discharger number four, that's where I worked for 27, 26 and a half years. Uh, this is, this is the plant. It discharges to a, a very, a very restricted flow waterway, which is why, uh, our plant was required back in the seventies to uh, upgrade. Um, this is the tale of the Clean Water Act, 1972, um, Basically, uh, when the Clean Water Act came out, and, and very shortly thereafter, actually a little bit before that, the state of California already recognized that you can't have three wastewater treatment plants, three snowflakes discharging into this restricted body, water body using secondary treatment only. Um, and to be honest, uh, I'm old enough to remember when Lower South Bay smelled bad. You know, we'd come on family vacations and be driving down the freeway way over, way over on the east side of the bay. Uh, and, you know, from the freeway, you could smell the putrid, awful smell of Lower South Bay. Um, and that was even after secondary treatment was added. So more needed to be done. Um, so in 1979, San Jose uh, finished uh, millions, uh, really about half a billion dollars worth of work uh, in today's dollars uh, to add a nitrification facility. And Sunnyvale and Palo Alto did the same uh, in 1980. And the charts uh, shown up in the upper side here are showing that right after that, that improvement, uh, nitrogen, uh, I should say ammonia nitrogen, was pretty much wiped out. These plants were treating it. There was just a trivial amount of uh, ammonia load was being added after that. And the total nitrogen also went down over time, especially after San Jose implemented full BNR in 1997, because the, the first stage was simply nitrifying, get rid of, getting rid of that ammonia. But the actual the actual treatment of nitrogen, total nitrogen, didn't happen in San Jose until uh, later in the 90s. Oh, I was going to mention that one of the, one of the issues uh, when when the first nutrient regulations were, uh, were were being proposed, and San Jose, Sunnyvale, and Santa Clara were were told that they're going to have to upgrade their plants. In desperation, they came up with a plan. I, I call it the bad idea of the 1970s, and that was to build a giant pipe and discharge secondary treatment waste north. Of, 
they were evaluating whether it would be cheaper to do that. And it wasn't much cheaper, and and it was determined to be just so environmentally uh, uh, destructive that that they never went down that path. And thank God, if that secondary waste was, we now know today, uh, given the flow regime, if that secondary waste had been discharged further north of the Dumbarton Bridge, all it would have done is just sloshed back into Lower South Bay. It would have been a disaster. So uh, uh, the right thing was done, and and for the right reasons. Um, and this is giving a small summary of the upgrades at San Jose. So the second, the, uh, the secondary, the secondary process was built in 1964. And that's the B, what I'm calling now BNR1, um, because it's been converted to biological nutrient removal in more recent times, but it was a, a secondary treatment only. And then 1979, this area, the nitrification BNR2 was added. And again, these tanks were not built for biological nutrient removal, but the cool thing was that by taking existing concrete tanks built for a different purpose, you can still kind of mix and match your flows and alter your, your aeration regime and, and, and achieve biological nutrient removal and actually reduce the amount of energy you pump through the system. Um, it's, it's, I think it costs the actual upgrade to go to BNR once in the 1990s when we went through this, as I recall, was about six million dollars, which maybe it's not exactly chump change, but in terms of San Jose's budget, which is eighty to a hundred million dollars a year, it, it really was a trivial expense um, and, and a miraculous uh, amount of uh, reduction once once it was implemented. And I'm showing a little bit of a stick diagram of what, how our process works. So anybody curious? And this is showing the the nutrient removals uh, when we went to secondary process, removing ammonia, turning it into nitrate. Uh, population was going up during that time, so the total nitrogen load kind of went up. But then when we went BNR in 97, we reduced uh, almost half of the nitrogen we were discharging, and phosphorus was even more dramatic. Part of that was because of phosphate bans and detergents as such. Part of that was because of treatment improvement. Um, and this is showing in another way that those, those upgrades at our plant and how nutrients uh, were squeezed out of the process. This is showing... Um, more recent years, uh, I retired 19, uh, 2018. Um, at the time I retired, we were doing, we were reducing nitrogen, total nitrogen by 70%. And now under Eric's watch as the, as the current compliance manager and, and, and the old, all the operators, the engineers, and of course the whole crew, uh, they've managed to reduce nutrients even further by adding new me metering and controls and and uh, basically improving the process, and it's going down, down. When I left, I was saying it was about 5,000 kilograms a day of nitrogen were being discharged. Now it's down around 3,000. That's, that's incredible. Uh, and phosphorus has also gone down. Again, better control of air valves and metering and, uh, and control of flows. Um, it just gets better and better. Um, this is showing what a, a primary uh, clarifier tank looks like, empty. Basically, you just let water flow through slowly, and it's a, it's a physical process. The, the magic does not happen here. The magic happens in secondary. Um, this is showing uh, what these bubbling tanks look like when you're altering that aeration scheme. So we have basically that the anaerobic uh, valley of death right here for bacteria. There's, uh, there's mixing, but there's no aeration. Uh, and so this is where your phosphate, uh, phosphorus accumulating bacteria uh, can thrive and basically your denitrifiers, they can slip through this. You basically select for the bacterial population you want, and then you put them into an aerobic zone and then you flip them over to an anaerobic zone. And it's just uh, a, a really cool thing. Oh, Katie raised her hand. Yes, Katie. I, I did. Jim. So um, we are at, um, we're just about up to eight. I wondered if you wanted to yes, have a, a I do. discussion, but we want to hear more from you after. If yes. you're able to stay and talk. Yes, okay. I will just say, look at that beautiful water. Oh. <laughs> and we get green water just downstream. That's where the nitrate. Look at these beautiful fish. <laughs> we have thousands of tiny little fish and big giant fish that we grow in, uh, actually grow in our outfall channel. This is what I define as success. And so anyway, I'll turn it over now and uh, to let anybody talk. So thank you. So everyone, please raise your hand um, and we'll try to get in as many questions as we can. 
Oh, um, and I'd like I'd like to give Amit, Amit and Lorian would like to have a few words, I think. That yes. would be wonderful. Yes. So, hey. um, Amit, well, I, I see your hand raised. Um, can you unmute yourself and and maybe we'll um, pause the the um, screen share so we can see you. Hi, Amit. Hi there. Um, thank you, Jim. It is so nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So you gave a, a wonderful presentation, um, and you know, and it's kind of all the deep into the biology of it. I don't think I would go so deep, um, but I could give you a, a brief summary of what is happening in East Bay Mud as part of the optimization. So as Jim described, we are landlocked and we use pure oxygen for our secondary activated uh, uh, sludge process. And the reason we use it because our, you know, our land is limited and we have very, very small footprint where we have to do this BOD removal. We didn't have to do ammonia removal uh, like San Jose had to do for decades because of our location where we discharge too. But recent concerns of nitrogen level, we were looking at um, you know, alternative options, how we can do this. And as Jim said, every plant is like a snowflake. Ours is, I think, is the best looking snowflakes. And before it used to be San Jose, but now that I work for EB Mud, that is now number one for me, of course. But the reason it's also unique is we also do co-digestion. So we also take organic waste from uh, commercial and, and, um, and, and, you know, and food producing industries that come to us. So we do much more than just wastewater treatment. But that's another reason why our nitrogen limit tends to be, uh, nitrogen discharge gets to be higher. So we did some preliminary estimate of what Jim uh, was referring to. Uh, for optimization and upgrade. And we looked at various options. We looked at side stream, we looked at complete overhaul of our secondary system. The estimates was climbing. Um, in the latest, uh, I mean, we started with 1.2 billion and the latest was almost 2 billion. So it's a significant amount and, sign and it's gonna take decades to build. So we, at the same time, because of this high cost and you know how we have to raise our you know, taxes to cover these increased costs, we were looking at alternative options. And our engineers and process engineers have been doing this research for about almost five years now. We started small with a uh, laboratory scale. Then we started doing 5% uh, of the flow. What we tried to do is one of a kind, is we wanted to convert our pure oxygen secondary plant into a BNR plant during summer months. So summer months we have low flow, and that's where we're required to re reduce our nutrients. So first we started doing with 5%, then we started doing with 25%, then we do it last year, 50% of the flow. And we, it's, a, it's a slow process. First we start nitrifying, and then we start denitrifying. So we start at um, about late spring in April and May, and then we, our system gets fully operational in June. And the results have been remarkable. Um, and we are very pleased to report that we were able to remove almost 65% of the total inorganic nitrogen going through this half stream, whatever we are pushing it through the split side. Next, or this summer, we wanna push 75% of the flow through this modified uh, secondary process. This is gonna save all the investment we'll have to do in future. So hopefully, Within the, uh, the next year, we are hoping, our upper limit hope is almost reducing overall nutrient reduction by 65%. What do you see? The chart that Jim showed us, it was 7,000. 2022, it was 9,000, almost, no, higher than that. It was 11,000 in 2019. And then last year was almost close to 10,000 plus. Now this year we are 7,000. So we have dramatically reducing the nutrient going into the bay. And next year, we hope to do even better. This has been a very cost-effective solution. Um, but it's, as our plan, you know, going to be running in winter versus summer mode. So it's a unique, just like Jim described, 
It's a one of a kind. And I think after this, uh, other plants might be a mother pure oxygen plant who doesn't do BNR, probably follow our path and follow our technology. And we probably produce some power, you know, papers and probably patent, patent the technology too. So very proud of the staff that what we have been doing here. You. Um, do we have um, any questions? Um, please raise your hand and you are able to before unmute Katie, yourself. Katie, yes. Before we go forward, perhaps if Lorian wanted to say something. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Hi, uh, Lorian. Hi there. Nice to meet all of you virtually. Um, my name is Lorian Fono. I'm the executive director of the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, and we're the association that represents the 37 snowflakes that discharge to the Bay. I mostly came here to uh, answer any questions folks had about any agencies that weren't EB Mud or uh, San Jose. I imagine most of you, most of the folks here, are probably in the EB Mud service area, as am I. Actually, I'm. I'm uh, zooming in from Berkeley, but uh, and also just to communicate that um, we have a really exciting slate of nutrient reduction projects that are moving forward now, will be moving forward soon, and are going to be mo moving forward within a span of a, a decade or so. Some big ones, uh, nutrient reduction through recycled water, nutrient reduction through constructed wetlands. So things are going to be moving forward in a serious way. And we're thinking hard about how to keep costs low for our ratepayers as we're moving forward. But happy to answer any questions about other facilities as well. Um, I just like to say um, thank you so much for um, giving us this uh, really uh, close view of all of the innovation it's, and uh, adaptation to specific sites. Um, I'm a, a former teacher and I love visiting wastewater treatment plants. And I know many um, people, uh, many of the many um, groups are taking um, trips to, to see um, the uh, phytoremediation areas. I believe that might be in Richmond um, where water I believe is, is put out and where plants um, convert um, nutrients into plant material and somehow that is um, uh, but um, I um, I do do you take um, student groups on tours to give them a uh, view of the processes that you're describing hello anyone can answer or not <laughs> <laughs> I saw somebody, there was a comment about PFAS. I, um, oh, yeah. I, I can't see the chat, though. I, yeah, there have been a, a, a couple of questions about um, about um, other contaminants, um, like, um, uh, let's see, PFAS, of course, also um, uh, drugs, um, other um new other chemicals that might be in the water um how and do you is is addressing these part of your um upgrade processes maybe that might cover some of those questions yeah can i if if uh yeah if you want um can i share screen for a second again is that sure. possible yeah just go ahead and uh so okay i'll share and share there we go and I'll put a, a couple of slides up. Not so much because I, you know, it's like I'm not, I'm not happy you asked that question because the truth is these are emerging contaminants. It's like, oh, um, and and they continue to be a problem. Uh, I, you know, believe it or not, I had this image because I I knew this question was going to get asked. <laughs> and uh, this is showing PFOS. This is from the, uh, the the State of the Bay report from San Francisco Estuary Institute, the, the 22 report. Uh, see that red dot there, that largemouth bass, you know, that's like kind of, I mean, now these are parts per billion. So these are low concentrations, but but PFOS, this was PFOS as opposed to PFAS, but I think, I think the two kind of go hand in glove. 
Um, so there is some PFAS in fish tissue. Um, but see that largemouth bass, that red thing? Look at this. Check this out. That's the bass. That's it. That's right. That's the bass. That's my bass. <laughs> we we collected those fish from our outfall channel. Uh, this was Dr. Jim Hobbs. So this is 2015 when we collected the fish. It was a couple of years later until the analysis came out. You'll notice we wrapped them in foil and we sent them to the San Francisco Estuary Institute. And they, they did the fish tissue analysis. Um, because these fish were were immersed from from the two uh, the two fish that are on the on the right hand side are the largemouth bass and the common carp. Those are freshwater fish. So once they're when they were in our outfall channel, they were they were entrained there because it's salt water out in the bay and they cannot tolerate salt water. Those fish grew up from egg to adult in our effluent. Um, I was so proud of that. And then we sent them to San Francisco Estuary Institute and don't oh, that bass, it had a bunch of PFAS in it. <laughs> so you, you can't win. You can't. That's what I'm trying to say, folks. You just can't win. Uh, uh, and it's not not just PFAS, but there's there's, you know, a, a slate of uh, pollutants like we know uh, Eric. Uh, Eric's in the audience. Uh, he's now compliance manager when the, the, the job that I had when I retired, he, he's taken it over. And Eric was part of uh, or at least participated in. Part of the study of uh, pharmaceuticals in fish tissue as well. I, I don't know if these particular fish were part of that. Uh, they might have been, um, but we found that like heart meds, you know, there's certain types of drugs that people take and they're designed not to break down in your body. They're designed, you know, like uh, albuterol was one of them for asthma. And so we excrete our drugs and it goes into the wastewater and the bacteria don't really treat it away. And and it gets into fish tissue and things. Some of them are problems. Some of them are not problems, or at least we don't know that they're problems yet. And I think PFOS and PFOA are, are in that category that we don't know of a bio, biological harm, but they do get into fish tissue and they do bioaccumulate up the food chain. Um, yeah, you know, these are, these are concerns. And this is where, this is where, yeah, your treatment plant cannot treat some of these comp compounds. They must be controlled at the source. Um, you know, and how do we do that? You know, one of them is, you know, to start regulating, you know, uh, maybe not, well, designing new, new drugs, I suppose. And then other things are to uh, carefully regulate the medical industry. Don't, don't overprescribe. Um, and uh, PFOS, PFOA, you know, alternate products and uh, source reduction is, is where you have to go. Uh, it, you know, maybe Lorian might know more, or maybe if Eric wants to chime in, that would be, could be useful. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take Amit next. I think, Kate, if it's okay, his hand was. Oh, yeah. Of course, yes. I was. Yeah, I was going to. That's great. I'll take my hand down. We have two quest interesting questions in chat, and one of them. Um, so let's hear from Amit first. I will take my hand down. Okay. Hey, thank you. I was gonna um, answer, try to attempt all the three questions in that order. The first question, I think Jim answered it very well. But I'll just add, our current treatment methods cannot remove PFAS or PFOA from the wastewater influent and also from biosolids. Biosolids, they're limited technologies that we have to totally burn it, incinerate it. That's the only way to get rid of them. So source control is the best way. And we have a lot of uh, messaging and a lot of uh, regulations. We're working with the lawmakers uh, for you know, developing all these rules, so we can manage it at the source. So we don't, you know, because we are just the pass through. We are not the, you know, you know, we're not the one who's creating this. That's that's a very important message for everyone to understand. The second question uh, I had somebody asked about the um, the concern about winter versus summer. Winter algae growth is not typically a you know concern because for algae to grow it needs not just nutrient it needs sunlight also it needs right temperature and it also depends on the salinity so in winter we have a more cloud coverage and higher turbidity so two of the elements does not quite favor the algae growth and we have not over the 10 15 15 years we have been observing we have not seen significant algae growth during winter at all. Hence, the requirements for us to monitor and lower the 
uh, nutrient loads only during summer months. So that's the second question. The third question, of course, we so all the 37 plants that you saw in the map are all located next to the bay. So sea level rise is a big concern. Um, so each plant is looking at, depending on their elevation, they're probably looking at how they're going to adapt to the rising sea levels. So I could give you the example of East Vermont. Yes, we have been looking at, we not only look at, at predicted different sea level rise at different years, like 2050, and what it's going to look like. 20, 2100, what it's going to look like. And right now, the weird, there's a lot of estimates out there, the, um, you know, the US, uh, US Army Corps and then BCDC, uh, and then along with uh, California, um, I think, short, uh, short uh, OPC or Ocean Protection Council, they have a lot of these projections. And we take the most, um, you know, the practical one, kind of on the not very high conservative, but oh. most likely scenarios. And we looked at the scenarios and then the impact from there. So we, we are looking at the vulnerable areas and we are bringing them higher elevation as we do projects there. We also develop design guidelines for every time we touch a new project because sea level rise is not gonna happen in tomorrow. It's gonna happen over the years and years. But so, so does our capital projects. It takes many, many decades to do that. But if we have the tools and design standards so we can adapt to these rising sea levels. And we're also collaborating with the Port of Oakland because where we are located, Port owns the, you know, the most of the uh, you know, area that they can improve and probably put a levy up. Also working with the city of Alameda and also San Leandro. There's like a, a, an, a, 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 a flood protection, um, I'm, the name is just slipping my mind right now. There is a you know, bunch of agencies that are working together on many funding opportunities for um, uh, you know, sea level rise protection projects. And we are contributing to them. We're collaborating with the projects and timing of our projects because we not only have our plants, we also have a bunch of pump stations, almost 16 pump stations all along the north and south along the bay. They are also in the low-lying areas. So we also have to bring them up. So there's a significant amount of infrastructure that we're uh, we are looking at protecting. Groundwater also rising. You know, when groundwater from sea level is coming in, as salinity increases. Salinity increases and then your corrosion increases. So we're looking at replacing our pipe materials with a pipe that are less corrosive. We're looking at lining up our new all our interceptors so we can lower the inflow infiltration into our pipes. So there's a lot of things in the happening right now. But it's a very good question. <laughs> I know you're short for the time, but I could probably go on. I had a, I got many, many hours talking about these topics. Well, it is getting late, but in the interest of time, can we have uh, Lorian and then Eric? Uh, how about you let Eric go? I think that uh, the, the source control importance of PFAS is what I was going to hammer on, and I think that's been covered. Thank you. Well, and I was I was actually going to um, talk to that as well. And Amit made a very good point that the wastewater treatment plants really aren't able to treat something like PFAS. We have studied um, extensively the uh, levels of PFAS coming into and leaving our treatment plants um, just over the past few years. And that has included even going upstream into you know, we, we call it the sewer shed, but it's basically all of the pipes that carry the sewage before it gets to the treatment plant and looking at the levels um, tar in targeted areas to see if we can identify where high levels of PFAS are coming from so that we can target that source control because there, because there really isn't a treatment solution. And then the other thing, just to add to the sea level rise question, a tremendous question, great question. And I would say yes, all of the agencies, because of our location, we are thinking about that. Amit gave some great examples of what's going on in the East Bay, in the South Bay, the Lower South Bay, where San Jose is. There's um, a federal project led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers called the South Bay Shoreline Project that's constructing a flood control levy um, to protect all of Silicon Valley. We're very engaged with them because that levy is 
it's going to go right across our property. And we need to be able to discharge 100 million gallons of wastewater onto the other side of that levy every day. So um, so we're in constant talks with them about what that levy is going to look like. And in addition to that, any of our new projects, new infrastructure projects at the treatment plant, we're making sure that they're built at elevations that will um, protect us from sea level rise in the event that there is flooding from other sources like riverine sources. Thanks. I'm going to call on myself right quick, but if anybody else has any questions, please raise your hand. Um, two questions. One is, is there a new uh, high-tech water pipe being uh, planned to be put in very soon between uh, to move water e either in or out of Al the city of Alameda across the estuary? Uh, I think it was like an emergency water supply, um, but it's sort of some kind of, I heard, high-tech Recycled this both it's uh, recycled water and portable water i think they got a federal grant to uh replace the aging intro, uh, pipe there and they're doing it uh tunneling uh in through the alameda channel connecting the alameda in, to the oakland side hmm. the uh, other question is will we be uh will we be drinking wastewater soon <laughs> the the regulations just got released for BPR, but in the the world of recycled water, and you know has a lot of different uh, in levels. So first one is recycled water, the one goes for irrigation. That one is widely used right now, and then there is another one is indirect portable reuse. So where we discharge into raw water um, sources. Um, and then a groundwater we discharge into. So indirectly, it come, recharges our groundwater, um, you know, uh, levels, and then we just, you know, draw from it. Now, the newest regulation is for BPR, which is direct portable reuse. So that's going to be water. It's going to be, uh, you know, pr produced from wastewater, and it's going to go through advanced treatment to go through, like, ozonation, microfiltration, and then reverse osmosis. And then again, disinfection. So there's many, many layers of purifying that water before it can inject into directly the water line. The new regulation just came out, but I am not aware of any plant that has been gone into, um, you know, um, you know, in a direct portable reuse yet. Um, but San Diego is the one that's the biggest one that is doing right now. But they are not injecting directly into that directly into the distribution line. What they're doing is they're producing ultra pure water, but they're discharging into their raw water um, uh, 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 reservoirs. And from there, they're drawing into the treatment plants. So yeah, there's a lot of advancement happening. It's costly, but you know, right now we have other options. We have options that the Sierra snowmelt is there. That's what we get mostly our water from. Um, then there is also a backup from various reservoirs and also from uh, what we call Freeport. It's just from the Delta area. And there is these other options partnering with the sewer agencies to get uh, direct portable reuse. But it's, it's, it's looking at, we're looking at various options and it's pricey. And, and, and also the regulations are super hard and you know, strict uh, what they came out. So there's challenges that we need to work out. Looks like we uh, don't currently have any questions now. Mm -hmm. I do want to thank everybody, okay. and especially our. Uh, Can I have a yes. Again, <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate every all the answers I've I've gotten from my questions, but I'm also you know I'm a beekeeper in the Northeast in New York, and so uh, neonics are a big concern for me. Uh, you know, with them being systemic, uh, they're every they're they're going to become everywhere. Uh, you know, they break down, but they're they're plant based, and they're going to break down. They they find them in water, 
And so do you encounter them yet in uh, waste treatment or, you know, wh where do you see that going uh, as far as, you know, future uh, issues? So, so I can, I can try to answer that one. Um, so we do look for the neonic pesticides um, and right now they're not that. So our, the state department of Re um, pesticide regulations does track them and they regulate the use of those, those pesticides. Um, there are some um, right now, some flea and tick prevention medicines that are readily available over the counter. And that would be the main pathway that I'm aware of, of how those neonicotinoid pesticides get into the waste stream. For most of the other pesticide applications, they really end up being more of a stormwater issue. We have a, we have separate systems out here. So our wastewater and our stormwater aren't combined. So it's more of a stormwater issue than a wastewater issue, but for the wastewater um, component, we do have um, outreach campaigns right now um, in the Bay Area to encourage pet owners to talk to their vet about switching to say chewable um, flea and tick treatments for their pets so that those pesticides, whatever whether they're neonicotinoids or other pesticides aren't getting washed down the drain and come to our treatment plant. We know that we can't treat them based off of the um, influent and effluent monitoring data that we have for a lot of these pesticides. So they pass right through the plant. Even an advanced plant like San Jose that has advanced secondary infiltration. Right. And I just shared a link in the chat that uh, has some of our outreach messaging um, for pollution prevention in general, but it has material on um, pesticide use and plant tick treatment specifically. Thank you so much. Um, we had a question earlier about um, about cat litter going into toilets. Is that happening a lot and is that still something that is you're not supposed to do given that there are advertisements that they're safe and all this sort of thing you know we talk about a lot of things ending up in the sewer that shouldn't but honestly i don't know that cat litter has come up maybe amit or eric know different toxoplasma gondi toxoplasmosis it we keep the message going that three Ps are supposed to go into the toilet, pee, poo, and paper. Um, no washable wipes. Washable wipes has been you know, a nightmare in the past, which there is, uh, you know, federal regulation is going to go out pretty soon to, um, to put the labels that they are actually not flushable. Um, the cat litter has not, maybe people are doing it, but not, not as significant to cause us grief. But we do see a lot of grit and sand, but that may be because of, uh, you know, uh, just inflow infiltration uh, and coming from the streets. Yeah, the, the three Ps is the, the key message. And, and I would say that cat litter is probably, if it makes it all the way to a wastewater treatment plant, probably not going to be a significant impact to the, the treatment process. It's probably going to clog up your sewer line going from your house out into the main line. And, and that would be a very unpleasant situation for the homeowner. Um, so, so it's going to, it's going to clog up the, the pipes leaving your house more than it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This has been amazing. There's a question about sampling for viruses in the sewage. So in the influent, like coronavirus? I think that's what they're probably referring to. Who wants to take this one? 
not seeing what the question is. Oh, can you say a few words about sampling viruses? I think this one's yours, and me. You guys have been EB Mud's been a leader on this one. So we sample um, sewers and we send it to the lab outside. We have been collaborating at UC Berkeley and then also a few other um, uh, labs that are uh, with Department of Health Services that are qualified to do so. So we don't do it in-house. What they do is they look at the concentration, the RNA con trace concentration of the COVID virus that, uh, that was very active indicator in during the early stage, days of the COVID where we could you know, measure it to the reported level of uh, the COVID and you know, come back with the relationship. And it, and it was used almost as a uh, early indicator of the, how it's spreading. So a number of plants participated, but to my knowledge, we don't actively monitor any other viruses. This was, um, I mean, back in the, uh, you know, 60s or maybe 70s, I, I was told we used to uh, monitor poliovirus for similar purposes. But um, recent times, that's the only one I'm aware of. Yeah, and I, I can add a little bit about San Jose. We partnered with Stanford University um, during the height of the pandemic to um, sample our influent for um, the presence of the coronavirus. And it was a very useful leading indicator um, in advance of when there was going to be a spike in the, um, you know, in the occurrence of the coronavirus. Other virus sampling, um, we don't do that routinely. Um, our disinfection process probably takes care of most of that. But I know that um, if facilities do want to get into the direct potable reuse um, world that Amit, Amit was mentioning earlier, and, and none of the regional uh, wastewater facilities are actively um, going towards that at this point. There's a lot of discussions and, and there's a lot of interest in learning more, but that does require a certain amount of uh, virus reduction in your treatment process if you're going to go into the direct potable. So that's just one of those additional actions that um, make it a little bit more challenging and expensive that Amit was um, talking about it for DPR. David, you have your hand raised. Yes, because it doesn't, that sounds rather, um, it doesn't sound like there's an agency or an entity that's specifically responsible for and regularly collecting data regarding uh, viruses that may be entering into that are part of, I should say, our waste stream. And so my question is, does that mean that um, sea life, whatever that might be, mm. if they're developing any uh, sea life out there, we're developing things like, I don't know, diabetes or cancer or tuberculosis or things like that, we would only know by accident or if we come across it? Pro probably yes. Uh, I... I uh... In my retirement, I go out monthly with the UC Davis crew in, in the effluent channel of San Jose and out in Lower South Bay. Um, and we examine, you know, every fish we catch and we observe uh, harbor seals, uh, you know, pelicans, uh, bird life and such. Um, no, and, and, uh, and it is on my mind. <clears throat> I can't say, I don't know if I would identify a, a viral infection I do look for uh, for signs of seal pups, uh, harbor seal pups, every spring. Um, not seeing signs of, of uh, you know, this is the thing. Lower South Bay is this sloshing bay where the water doesn't really get out anywhere. And there's three wastewater treatment plants, especially San Jose, discharging there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I you know, I started I started going out with those folks uh, specifically looking for signs of sickness illness uh you know population disturbance i'm i'm not seeing it um i can't say that i necessarily would see every bad thing that could possibly happen but you know the good news is we're seeing fish populations slowly seem to be rebounding uh the fish that we're concerned about the long fin smelt uh the anchovies the herring the sar uh, the the hand and this this the shad and such um yeah it's it's a good question. You know, how would would who would detect this, and who's really monitoring 
for uh, uh, the aquatic life that's downstream of a, of a wastewater treatment plant, uh, I, 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 I don't know that there's a regular program for that. Oh, another question. Um, are you guys responsible as well for the uh, infrastructure repairing of the um, tunnels, the sewers that the water travels through? The various plants or any of you people? <laughs> you bet. Uh, different agencies are either wastewater treatment plants, collection systems, that's what we call sewer uh, agencies, or many are both. And so I, I can let Amit and Eric both speak to what their agencies do. Yeah, we have actually interceptors that are that, you know, end point of all the collection system from different cities. So we serve Oakland, Berkeley, um, Al um, Alameda, and all these other cities. And they have their own collection system. They maintain their collection system, all the sewer pipes on the ground. And then they end up into our big interceptor pipes, which is like 84 inch pipe. But if we were a city like San Jose, where I used to be, I, I'm not speaking for Eric, because I used to work there. The city owns the collection system as well as the treatment plant. Um, so it, it, it depends. It's like Richmond, if you go, Richmond owns the collection system as well as the treatment plant. But if it's a sewer agency, um, sometimes they don't own the, the collection system. It's typically maintained by the city. Yeah, it, it's 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 just like the treatment plants are all unique snowflakes. <laughs> the ownership of the collection system um, is the same, and so like Amit said, so the the plant where I work is the San Jose Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility. So San Jose operates the plant. We're responsible for our collection system. Santa Clara also sends their wastewater to the plant that they own. They're responsible for their collection system. And then we get wastewater from Milpitas and we get wastewater from Campbell and Cupertino and they're all responsible for their collection systems. Uh, but they, they contribute to the funding of the wastewater treatment plant even though they don't own and operate it. So um, I mean, this has been wonderful um, and, you know, what an opportunity to, to ask you questions directly. Um, it's been great. Um, is this a, a, a good, um, are, are you able to, to stay longer? Are there other questions out there? So I, what I'm juggling is um, I have some end of program slides that I would like to show and I'd like to, uh, before we, could it continue on if people are still available and interested? Um, shall I go with possibly three minutes of, of closing slides and will you still be around after? There's interest for a couple more questions. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so um, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully to the right place. Um, Yes. Yeah, so, um, as I said, we're Rotary Nature Center friends, and um, one of the things that we do is actually monitor plankton in Lake Merritt. My floating controls. Okay. And so, um, this um, just this month we had a a impressive bloom of um, of um, skeletonema that um, turned our plankton. Um, samples uh, really dark like coffee um it was a benign plankton um it lasted a short while we don't sample every day of course but you know several days and then it disappeared and something else came in so something that's kind of we get an interesting view as, as, of the um different uh of the mobility and the not the mobility but the differences that you have in plankton from day to day in a place um, um, 
off of San Francisco Bay, part of San Francisco Bay. Uh, we've been watering them on uh, dissolved oxygen, which of course is um, of concern with eutrophication and also stratification. It's winter time. Um, if you right here, we see the um, the black um, stacked squares showing that there was an anoxic conditions in Lake Merritt in uh, August of um, 28th of 2022. Um, just this last week, uh, we were out after rains um, monitoring and oxygen is good. So um, trying to figure out the metabolism of the lake and how that works is um, something really interests us. Wanted to share, um, we've been participating in plankton monitoring programs and involving kids, um, looking at things like um, transparency and how it changes from year to year and so forth, um, involving um, teachers from our local schools. Um, I know, I, I just have to say how much, uh, I enjoy taking students on tours of wastewater treatment plants. And um, we were told, we went, went to San Leandro and I believe the director at the time, his name was Goldberg. He called the smell, the sweet smell of money. And at least three of the students that I taught um, are now working um, at high levels in water treatment plants. So um, it's a fascinating field and um, very, um, very happy to have had that exposure to, to actually see how one works <clears throat> and now to see how much um, improvement has been made. So I want to thank everyone for coming and invite you to come back in March when we're going to have another Lakeside Chat on March 1st, actually. Uh, we are going to hear from um, Dr. C.N.E. Corbin at Oregon State University about nature and equity in the urban landscape. She held positions. Um, she now lives in Oregon, of course, but she held positions and lived in Oakland, got her degree doctorate from UC Berkeley. I would like to uh, let everyone know that our programs are rebroadcast by the city of Oakland KTOP um, TV every um Sunday from six to seven. Um, the first two Sundays are old programs and I um, shared a number of them in the chat that related to relate to this pro this topic that we currently have. And let's see what we have here. Uh, yes, and um, we like to bring people to the lake, scientists um, and people who know about um, <clears throat> various aspects of um, management, science, and stewardship to talk to young people and regular interested citizens here at Lake Merritt. So um, we invite anybody who um, enjoys seeing what we do to follow us on Facebook, find out when we are actually doing a um, on-site program and consider making a donation uh, so that we can continue working with um, all the people of Oakland um, both adults and children. And um, I want to thank our producer, Rob Lamone, uh, Katie, I'm Katie Noonan, David Wofford, our co-chairs, um, Kirsten Furman, is art and design, and Janice and Patty and others help with our programs. So um, we're an all volunteer 501c3 nonprofit advocating for the philosophy of the Rotary Nature Center as founded by the original naturalists, um, Paul Covell and Rex Burris and, their, um, and Stephanie Benavides and others who followed um, in their footsteps and extending it um, to all the people of Oakland. And I think I'm going to unshare now. Um, I forgot how to do that. Yes, um, okay. Okay, so what I would like is for Rob or somebody to unshare me because I'm having an issue. But I would like to, oh, I know what I can do. I know exactly what I can do. Oh, yes. There we go. Thank you all so much for bearing with my clunkiness there. Um, so um, I'm, I'm wondering um, about the, um, the, are you, are, is there increased concern and um, pressure to uh, reduce nutrients related to the um, events of, of the fish kill and um, the bloom of heterosigma akashiwa, which seems to be a rather unique event. 
Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we are expecting that the third watershed permit, which is being reissued this spring, is going to require nutrient reductions um, that are being developed in conjunction with the science program at the uh, San Francisco Estuary Institute. And so what that's going to look like is we're going to have interim limits for nutrients that are based on current performance with final limits uh, representing a significant redu reduction in nutrient loads to the bay. Thank you. Um, this has been a long-term trend. Is this specifically related in language to the um, the plankton bloom that was harmful and so damaging? Or is it just, um, you know, getting on the realization that we have more people, more nutrients coming in, and that it makes sense to be um, proactive and not increase um, the load of nutrients? Uh, it is directly in response to the algal bloom that happened in, in 2022. So we had been considering nutrient and their impacts on the Bay, as, as Jim had mentioned, since 2011. And we knew that it was probably, um, at some point there were going to be limits, especially to offset increased loads due to population growth. But And we also knew that something like this could possibly happen. We just thought it was very unlikely. And then we had the event and were reacting to it. Thank you. So um, uh, we we always send out a post chat um, email with some some links and so forth. So um, definitely, if there's something important we should share, we'd love to um, include that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, um, you know, I've, I found there's a lot of, of very interesting discussion going on, um, and very you know valuable and interesting regarding the contribution of nutrients and what what all what all biology we need to look at to understand the event that happened in 2022. So I know um, Jim shared some some good links and I will include them. So do we have any more questions? So we do have a back sheet that I can share in the chat. Um, I think it's at a, aimed at a less knowledgeable audience than what I'm gathering this one uh, is, but it's sort of a good primer on the nutrient issue. That would be great. Well, I see Darwin's birthday is coming up in 10 days. Thanks to Jerry Lips. Yes. In the chat. Thank you, Jerry. And and what an important um, contributor to our understanding of dynamics between species and within species. And, you know, still trying to see how that all works out in, in our modern world. So, um, yeah, February 16th, same year and same date as Abraham Lincoln. Katie, some folks who won in, in trivia would like you to put your email again, again so they know where to let you know that they won yes. so they can get their prize. Absolutely. Okay, there's my email. And um, Betsy's also been taking down notes so um, definitely I will email you and we'll figure out a good way to get you your prize. Right. Or you can just reach out to her and then she'll have my list. Mm -hmm. I must say what a delight it's been to have um, uh, so many people from the industry and have this cross pollinization of discussion. That's been really special. So glad that you could uh, join us. Our pleasure. It was amazing. 
thanks to thanks to Jim for uh, letting us all know so we could uh, pile on in after him. Oh yeah, I wanted <laughs> I wanted to surprise you and tell you later, but yeah. I I, I appreciate I appreciate joining and um was uh was it's good to see Jim again and uh you know hear hear him do his thing. Um he's, <laughs> he always has given great presentations. So good to see you haven't slipped on that, Jim. Jim, I thought I made it clear to you that you were hard enough for me to keep up with. <laughs> and now you bring these others along. <laughs> <laughs> they were afraid of what I was going to say. <laughs> no, we're just going to help Jim with more information. <laughs> well, is, is there right. a possibility, uh, Jim, to get uh, you cited a paper in your talk? Uh, is there a possibility to get a link to that? Oh, oh, that was the, uh, well, it was the Don Gray. Uh, yeah, Mitt in the presentation, the, uh, it was actually yeah. an article. So there's not a, it's not a paper though. Uh, is that what you're talking about? It was, yeah. That was the yeah, BNR. Was, there may yeah, have been a link, link on the bottom of it, but I. Oh, it was a link, link to the article. It was, yeah, it was CASA. Um, no, no, it was uh, CWEA. Oh, okay. Uh, about a year could you ago. give that to Katie and maybe Katie could send it out? Yeah, I'll do that. do that. I will definitely do that when, if you can share that with me, Jim. Yeah, yeah, I can send you that. Yeah, it's cool. in the presentation okay. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's possible I might, I might be able to do it right now if I can. Let's see. Oh, I might be able to get that. Let's see. Let me grab it. I'd like to share that when I'm in meetings with um, my affordable housing development colleagues, and I'm really sort of pressuring them or encouraging them to think outside of the box, which because of the type of funding that goes down for affordable housing, that's not really easy to do. Um, but uh, in terms of design and how do how can we design these uh, future uh, uh, places that human wow. beings go into and out of and are using so that it connects people with the environment and informs people. Uh, and again, uh, part of my uh, mm -hmm. continual awareness is uh, uh, reaching uh, black and brown and low income communities more and more with environmental understandings. So back to the idea of affordable housing development and uh, designing uh, uh, experiences where when you're in a building, like when you're using uh, a water faucet or a toilet or I, I as examples, I say, uh, what, what if there was a way that when you turn on the faucet, somehow uh, it uh, connects you to or reminds you to the experience of where that water has just traveled from and when you flush the toilet, it sort of somehow connects you to or reminds you of. And I'm, you know, I hate to be cheesy and say, you hear a voice that says, I'm off to the treatment plant. <laughs> but uh, it could be, I'm just really trying to stimulate uh, that type of interactive um, thought process. And no, it's not about water, but, you know, we have to walk to school anyway. Why couldn't something be going on in our shoe that was going to generate the power that we use at school when we get there? And therefore, even from childhood, we begin to have this connection that the world I live in is supplied by things. I'm a part of that process. And I've got to take some, uh, I can maybe then begin to take some more ownership of it. I love that, David. And we've actually been thinking about more public outreach about the value of wastewater and, you know, just even basic education about what does happen when you flush the toilet. Does it just disappear? Um, and, I, you know, that's certainly not not there, not universal. I, I, if, if you're willing, I would love to use you as a, uh, a somebody to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, there are several links i would suggest one is first one i would say ebmart website it has the water side story and the wastewater side story in one website so it talks about water conservation where the water comes from 
what are we doing to protect the water, how you know, precious it is. And then also has the wastewater portion, where the water goes, how it gets treated, and what happens when the area flush. So it's in one page. Please. And I know San Jose, if you look up the San Jose wastewater website, they made a, you know, a prize-winning video, and it's called Behind the Flush. Mm -hmm. And it, it is has a like a really five, there's a five minute version and then there's an eight, you know, whatever, maybe 18 minute version. It talks about all the process that happens in a wastewater in a very easy to follow, but they actually go through very technical details too. Um, but it's, it's, it's easy to understand. I actually took that presentation to my son's class when he was in second grade. Um, and, you know, they were, they, they loved it. And I got so many questions from, from folks about the bubbles and, you know, how, how many people does it take to blow the bubble to do we wear gloves when we work with wastewater, you know? <laughs> so there was a lot of interesting uh, discussions. Wow. Thank you. Lorian, did your contact go into the chat for me? If not, I can, I'm sure I can find it, but. Thank you. Oh, I love the name behind the flush. <laughs> yeah, look, look, look up by San Jose Wastewater Treatment Plant behind the flush. I would even go to YouTube and do a search on behind behind the flush. San Jose will show up. Yeah, historically we've all we've been very you know if you don't hear about us, we're doing our job well. But that's changing as, as we'd like to bring the community more into what we do. Um, one thing that we're talking about is uh, arranging bike tours as well to, um, between treatment plants and uh, different what elements of uh, water and wastewater in infrastructure. So, and I just put a link to behind the flush for the- Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I can include these. And, and we also um, have a similar graphic that is uh, water pathways uh, that um, because San Jose also does a significant amount of recycled water for, for irrigation and other non-potable uses. So it shows, I was talking about the separate sewer system. There's a storm sewer system where that drains from the streets out into the creeks. There's the wastewater system that goes from your toilets um, to the wastewater treatment plant. And then there's the recycled water system that goes, uh, that takes the treated wastewater from the um, wastewater treatment plant and sends it out back into the community. So there's a graphic that shows shows those wastewater pathways too. So I think that's a little bit of the, the spirit of what you were talking about, David. Yes, uh, some of the people on the line with us just uh, last year taught me the difference between the storm water and wastewater pipes. Well, it is a great field trip. Um, uh, it, I used to take students to the San Leandro wastewater treatment plant every year and went, and it was um, a wonderful experience. Um, it kind of um, set the tone. It was really an eye opener, I think to start an environmental science pro project uh, program. And we made sure that every student who entered our program went to that tour. Um, if they missed it, um, we got them into the next one <laughs> um, because it's such an eye opener to see what is behind the, you know, the, the kind of lifestyle that we enjoy with cleanliness and um, you know, everything being neat and geared to our convenience to see what, what happens on the other side of the flesh, actually. And uh, the students enjoyed it, actually, in most cases. And we met, um, we met um, one of the people who is now um, <clears throat> one of the narrators on one of those um, tours um, who actually um, got her high school degree from Oakland High and was able to talk to the students about her path, career path. And as I said, there were at least three other students that went through our program who um, are working now in wastewater treatment. So um, 
it, they, it was called the sweet smell of money <laughs> <laughs> because uh, yeah um Come to think of it, I had a little help uh, and uh, from strange places be, becoming being inspired to be here. The bullies, when I was in school, used to try to get me really interested in where wastewater went. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, um, this has been amazing. I will definitely share all of these um, great resources that you've um, put in the chat. So Katie, this this program uh, doesn't exist anymore, the one where you were taking students to San Leandro? They don't go there anymore, but um, it's still possible to, I, I talked to the, the um, people there because I had known them. Actually, what we used to do, we used to pair the Davis Street, Street Transfer Station, Solid Ways, Municipal Solid Ways, with the um, San Leandro Wastewater Treatment Plant. So I called them and they, I asked them if they still did tours and they said, yes, indeed they did. So I'm considering um, organizing one for people who might be interested um, through our organization um, because um, it really is an eye opener and it's very fascinating to see um, how the bugs are put to work. Well, they're also building a new constructed wetland. So they're going to be using mm-hmm. a nature-based system to further yes. treat their uh, their effluent and actually remove nutrients through the wetland. Um, so that'll be that another very element cool. that's very accessible to uh, a, a tour coming through. Yeah. So, and, and then again, East Bay mud in our, in Oakland's own backyard, I think that's something that um, I didn't know a lot about because I had my book up there with San Leandro, but um, you know, this sounds like that's also another place to, to learn about some of the technology and careers and the, you know, just the whole uh, aspect of our right there um, in downtown Oakland. That sounds like I'd like to investigate doing a tour there. Um, there's nothing like being there. Um, we still do the tours, so yes. if you're interested, I Fantastic. just think, um, you can sign up. Once we have enough number of people, we will we'll do that. We'll arrange for the tour and contact you. Excellent. I think I have two two young person groups that are, are somewhat interested, and I'm going to see if, and then we could also put it out as a, um, as to say, um, in real real time, you know, in-person event. To take a look, uh, because uh, it's so much a part of our the ecology that we are immersed in that um, people are not aware of. I think it'd be really a, a fun thing to do and, and very you know, rewarding. Let me get these. Gotta get these. I once did a tour of the Oakland. I, excuse me, not Oakland. The Orange County facility. Fascinating. Aww. One of the more interesting things I ever did in this regard. Is that the one that does actually come close yes. to the toilet to tap, the toilet to tap one? Yes, they um, mm-hmm. but they pump it all back into the Santa Ana River aquifer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they don't just go directly. Well, they treat it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a groundwater uh, injection. So they have indir- that's the first of its uh, IPR, an indirect portable recharge. So they right. have they have the reverse osmosis, ultraviolet disinfections, and then microfiltration, all that process from the wastewater, and then they put it back there. Yeah, right. it's, it's a really nice facility. There used to be a great YouTube about it, and it was called Toilet to Tap, um, and it was exactly. But I, I haven't been able to find it. Or in the later years of my teaching, I was not able to find it. But I, I no. think that's something I'd like to share if I could find it. Katie, At I the time I personally. toured it, they were pumping twenty percent of the water it was uh, toilet to tap uh-huh. water. Wow. Katie, so they I still got a lot of Colorado River water. <laughs> Katie, down. I would recommend uh, not to never to use the term toilet to tap. <laughs> yes. It's actually not toilet to tap. There is like 20 different process in between of course so, but people sometimes it gets the bad name that you mm-hmm. know it's coming from our toilet um i think that that labeling does not do it justice it's just my personal opinion mm-hmm. 
Okay. <laughs> sure, I hear you. I hear you. They address that. Um, they address that in in the in the program quite well. Yeah. Um, well, that, yeah. that it was it was historically a pejorative that was actually mm -hmm. used to shut down recycled water. Ooh, no. Yes. <laughs> And now it's you know there there's been somewhat of a reclaiming of that mm -hmm. that language of toilet to tap, but yeah, it's yeah I hear you. I won't use it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I actually well, was at the Orange County facility just two weeks ago, and mm -hmm. uh, I got to taste some of their um, uh, their process the the, the they, water they, that came out of their process prior to injection, and I got to say that. Uh, I do like my McCallumney watershed EV mud water, but this this can uh, put it up to you know this this can compete. So I I think you know the question are we going to be drinking toilet water soon? I, I you know we should be so lucky. <laughs> but as Amit said, I, you know, if if you live here, the answer is probably no, not soon. Yeah. Well, toilet toilet to tap is a real attention getter. And then you can <laughs> clarify it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we quit? How do you get uh how do you get on one of these tours? Oh, you on go to the website. Phone. Yeah. I, I just send the link in there and there's a contact phone number and an email. Just oh, send okay, I saw email. that. Uh, and then when we have enough number of people, then we uh, inform all the group that we're going to have the, uh, you know, tour time and, you know, uh, schedule. And then you can uh, confirm. I'm going to come in on the side with Amit. Uh, all right. <laughs> with, with the uh, toilet. <laughs> For engaging, I'm going to be with him, Matt. You want to move away from the word toilet. <laughs> Oh come on! It, it's it's great to get an audience, and then no. and that and you need that. No, no, I I want to stick with the whole getting the audience, but uh, yeah. I want to try and drop the uh, the negative. Uh, what's that word? Per, per, purge or something? Um, the negative connotation. Yeah. Uh, that uh, to go along with the word toilet with a lot of human beings for some reason. It's the kind of thing that they don't really want to think about unless they really, really need it. I mean, to use it. And then after that, they don't want to really think about it anymore. So. But, but, they, like uh, to know, but they do like to know where their toilet water goes. And I hear what you're saying. Once you capture their attention, you can work through and get to tell them <laughs> about the other 20 processes. Uh, right. But exactly. as soon as I... As soon as I can think of a better word, though, I, I'm substituting. <laughs> I'm I working on that. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to just um, say something. Michelle about has my... something to say. Oh. Yes, Michelle. How about Treasure Michelle? Island? Wait, no, no, no. Toilet, call it Treasure Island. Michelle, hey, hey. Please, Michelle. Please, Michelle. please. You have not, you have not said a peep all night. Michelle, okay. please, please take the floor and, and, and ask your question or make your comment. Water in, water out. Where does it go? Yes, Michelle. It takes the word toilet out of it there, correct? And promotes yes. the word water. Water in, water out. Where does it go? <laughs> That's nice. You know, I did stand-up comedy for two years. All these people know me. Well, some of them know me. <laughs> and uh, I, used, I, I was an uh, educator for the Contra Costa Water District for uh 15 years and independent contractor so um i'm around i'm a um a friend of this group and gosh i had to say something about water in water out where does it go in addition to where did your water come from because there's a drinking water facility the contra costa water district they don't do the wastewater that's where you bring in the secondary thing so water in Water out. Where does it go? Sorry, Michelle. Uh, we've missed you. Oh, oh yes. Uh, happy to ha have you back around. Anthony's asking about. Ask me about. Can we still say the word uh, term potty mouth? And I'd say uh, the only time I like using potty mouth is when I'm talking to somebody, and I really mean it with your potty mouth. Um, <laughs> but the uh, 
Let's see. Somebody put in the big flush. Nice. And uh, I was considering slippery when wet. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm really trying to <laughs> entice them a little bit. Hazard. So, so, do you recognize my background? Sort of. So, um, we, use the, we use the technical term water reuse. That kind of covers everything. Well, it's all reused water. It's exactly. all like with a tiny, tiny exception, maybe from cause, you know, from comets or whatever. It's four and a half or whatever billion year old water. It's been around many times. Exactly. Yeah. Reduce, reuse, oh. recycle. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. water purification. So the background I just wanted to say is from the, is a mural inside the, bathroom which has been closed now for like five years of the rotary nature center in oakland at lakeside park and it's i think it's to me it's really interesting i got out of the way of it um, because it was created by um by people to illustrate their connection to the uh water where does it go aspect and the processes that are made to that water and it also has some little um comments about anti-fluoridation and so so it was like contentious then you know there's all these things that are contentious related you, to and you know on. what you know yeah. what miss katie mm. i thought you were like sitting in somebody's bath that bathroom ah. public restroom looks like she's sitting I on am. that toilet. public like <laughs> you're sitting in a public restroom i am yeah i know that's a good thing <laughs> Yes. Um, water in, water out. Mm -hmm. Story at six, film at 11. Mm -hmm. End of comedy routine. Oh, my goodness. Well, wow. later. Amazing. That is amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. Um, do we have more, more um, comments, discussion, or reminiscences that you'd like to share? Um. So I, I really mean it about possibly organizing a trip, um, and I'll um, I'll put that in my email if anybody wants to um, possibly come. We'll see if we can arrange a uh, a tour. That Let's do the Oakland facility. I would like to do that. I would really. I, yeah. I, I love the San Leandro one. It's really kind of cool too. Um, but uh, we have a program called the. Um, um, California Climate Corps, no, California Climate Action Corps Fellows. And I made contact with them and some of them are interested in possibly coming. They're like um, people who have just graduated from college with an interest in, um, you know, with, in climate, conservation, um, sustainability and all that. So they'd be a really interesting group to, to bring. So I wanna work on that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, um, Eric, if you're still in. Thank you to just everybody. Um, thank you, Lorian. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, your all your comments and resources that you've shared. It's wonderful. Um, thank you, David thank and you, Katie, everybody. for another great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And I uh, hope we will see you again. Um, there's just so much to discuss from the vantage point of Lake Merritt and on our little spot by the bay. Um, as a window looking out on it all, it's pretty, pretty cool. So well, you now have contacts in the sewage biz. So if you ever want more content, we all love to talk about it. You know, Friday nights. That'd be wonderful. I really appreciate that. That'd be cool. And just like my family always said, I would end up having contacts in very low places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm sure this is what they had in mind. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for inviting me, Katie. And and uh, yeah, and thanks for all the old friends who showed up. And very interesting. Oh, Very Jim. interesting. Thank you. Jim, thank you so much for, for bringing your friends. Beautiful. Thank you for coming to Lake Merritt so many times to look at fish and look at um, critters and everything. And um, it's just amazing all of your interests and expertise. I really appreciate it.
really, really. What great role models. Well, I guess this could be it. Okay. Um, everybody have a wonderful weekend um, as the rain comes down and stresses the sewer pipes and overflows. <laughs> we once visited a, the treatment plant um, right in the middle of a, a big rainy spell. And oh my gosh, it was just, it was pretty crazy how much water was coming in and what to do with it. And it was, um, it was always, it was always interesting when you went to this, the, on this tour because it was different every time. Sometimes it was really stinky. I mm. mean, and other times it was, you know, it was fine, you know, there were birds, mm. you know, chirping and, and catching bugs and it was um, amazing. Yeah, always remember a, a well-run sewer plant has five basic smells, musty, marshy, <laughs> earthy, oily, and tarry. That's from the Ken Carey, that was the California instruction books. Wow. Musty, marshy, earthy, oily, and tarry. Yep. Whoa. <laughs> er, Eric remembers to know. that. Jim, you'll, you'll be happy to know that I, I repeat that to all new hires now. And, yeah, yeah. And, and if you smell something else, it's not a well-run sewer plant. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. Well, everybody, um, for the good of the order, really appreciate your being here. Are there are any more um, things to say? If not, I think it's time for us to, um, to say goodnight, and we'll send our post-chat letter to everybody. Really appreciate your attendance, and it's been another wonderful night. So thank you all so much. Okay. Right. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I get to learn something once a month, for sure. <laughs> sure. I learned a lot. That was really great. Thank you all. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night now.